invite you to reach and grab your copy of God's Word and turn to Matthew chapter 8. Uh, we're going to spend uh, our time today in Matthew chapter 8 and 9. Also reach into your Creek Guide and pull out your sermon note insert so you can follow along with the passages and make some of your own notes. And I want to begin, to begin a brand new series today entitled Impressions. And over the next couple of weeks, we are going to look at the subject of the healing ministry of Jesus. Now, I, I know that uh, because of uh, the kind of church we are and the kind of backgrounds that many of us came from, uh, that can be a little bit of a scary thing because uh, some of us, we understand that Jesus healed. We know the apostles healed. We know Paul healed. Uh, we know uh, Moses in the Old Testament, Elijah, and uh, the church, they had a lot of miraculous powers that they could use, but we sometimes don't understand how they're to be used today or why they were active then and aren't active now or they are active now and weren't active then. We, under, we don't understand all of that stuff. And so the next couple of weeks, I want to talk you through the healing ministry of Jesus and really what it means for us. And, and as I do so, I want to do so under the, under the heading of impressions. Now, uh, if you've got your sermon note insert, notice the first definition I have for you there is a definition for an impression. So let's look at it. It says, a strong effect produced by an agency or influence, a mark, an indention, etc., which is produced by pressure. Now, I chose to title this message, Impressions, because we need to understand that every person that Christ came into contact with, He left an impression on. He made a mark or an indention, and notice it's produced by pressure. And so I make an impression, whether it's, a, uh, whether it's moldable clay or whether it's some other thing. If I'm going to leave an impression, it requires pressure. And I want you to know that I believe, I strongly believe, that um, God's call on the life of our church and in our church is that we would make an impression on our community. How many of you understand that? And we not only should make an impression on our Jerusalem, but also our Judea, Samaria, and even the remotest parts of the earth. I mean, we are about applying the pressure of the gospel of Jesus Christ in every home, in every life, in every place that we possibly can come to. Now, there's a second definition I want to give you that could also, and I, I, I thought about actually titling this sermon series, this word, and it's the word touch. It's the word touch. Well, let's look at a definition of touch. It's to put a hand or a finger, etc., cetera, uh, on or into contact with something, to feel it or perceive it, to bring into contact with something. In other words, when we think about touch, everybody take and show me your hand. Everybody show me your hand. Everybody put your other hand up. Now, I know some of you, just because of the Christian world for you, you came from, when you put one hand up, you change down. How many of you are a little uncomfortable putting both hands up in church? All right? Now, I want you to do this. If you're close enough, I want you to reach over and touch the person to your left or your right. If you know them real well, go ahead and just give them a good hard shove. Leave, it may not be a lasting impression, but leave a good solid one, right? All right? Now, if you really want to, just get all in their face, all right, with your hand. And I'm kidding. Don't do that. <laughs> you say, why are we talking about impressions and touch as it comes to Christ's healing ministry over the next couple of weeks? Because I want you to know, and write this down, Jesus had a very high-touch ministry. Jesus had a very high-touch ministry. And my prayer is that as a church, we would continue to understand that God's call on our life is to be very high touch. See, our message as a church is not in words only, but it's also in works. Our message as a church is not only proclamation, but it's power. Our message is our church is not simply just communicating the gospel. But it's living the gospel, impressing and touching on people what God uh, uh, has in store for them. Now, I also understand that when I begin to talk about um, the healing ministry of Christ because of our Christian worldview, and I'm using that word Christian worldview, I want you to hear it clearly. There are lots of worldviews out there. 
But just among those of us who are believers or believe in the Bible, there, there are many different, uh, uh, there's a large spectrum, there's a long, wide continuum on how we view the miraculous in the Bible or healings in the Bible uh, or uh, whether they thought, well, we're secessionists, we believe they stopped back in the New Testament or whether they believe they're still existent. There, there's a wide range. You say, Pastor, how wide is the, wide is the range of, of how people believe in the Christian worldview, how wide is the range? Very wide. If you want to write this down, it's not in your notes, but I'm just going to kind of pretend, uh, uh, I'm going to lay out a continuum for you uh, of, uh, of how people have responded historically and even in present day to the miraculous in the Bible and the healing in the Bible. And uh, so let me just go all the way over here to this side. And, and if you want to write something, if you want to draw a line, just write on this side, um, write the words dead deist, D-E-I-S-T. You say, what is that, pastor? Well, Deist believed that God, and they, were, they had a Christian worldview, but they believed that the God of the Bible, the creator of the world, basically created the world, wound it up like a watch, and it's just ticking away, and now he's stepping back and watching time just tick down. Probably the well, most well-known in American history of these Christian deists was Thomas Jefferson. The, uh, uh, the, one of the founding fathers. As a matter of fact, he was probably uh, uh, one of the least strong Christians that was one of the original signers and one of the founding fathers. As a matter of fact, uh, many times people will uh, perjure all the founding fathers and say they were all like Thomas Jefferson when they were not. As a matter of fact, he was probably the least Christian, least religious, but I want you to know he believed the Bible and he lived the Bible and he walked the Bible. He understood that God, the creator of the universe, created the world, but he was a deist. As a matter of fact, what he would do, what does it mean to be a deist? You, you don't believe that God is active involved in the miraculous today. Okay, that's what a deist believed. As a matter of fact, you can go to the Smithsonian right now and see an actual copy of Thomas Jefferson's Bible that he created. What he did is he took all the miraculous out of the Bible. I have an image of it up here for you. Notice what the term or the title of his Bible is. The life and morals of Jesus of Nazareth. So what did he do? He thought Jesus was about a was God's son, but he was a moral teacher, basically. We ought to look at the morality that Jesus uh, lived by and live that way. But he was a dead deist. As a matter of fact, uh, he did something that I could never bring myself to do. He was so bought, he had so bought into the Enlightenment era and the, the deist uh, teaching that he actually took Bibles, his Bible, early on, and because he couldn't explain it and he couldn't see it and he couldn't deal with it, he actually cut out the miraculous. Uh, I've got a copy of one of his Bibles actually at the Smithsonian. Notice there are cut out parts. And the parts of the New Testament that he cut out were those that had to do with the miraculous because he just couldn't accept them. He couldn't deal with them. So on one side, we have those who are of the Christian mindset that nothing miraculous could possibly happen today. On the wall, on the other end of the spectrum, go all the way from the opposite of that. You say, Pastor, what would we call these? I don't really know what, what you would call them, but you might want to just write on the other end of your line, just write, whoa, crazy, crazy. I don't know what the right term for them is. They're all about the miraculous. As a matter of fact, you've seen some of these people on TV. You've, you've heard these people. They're all about God's healing power. God wants to heal every disease. God wants to fix everything. God does this and God does that. I mean, these guys are the total opposite of that guy. They are over here. They believe. As a matter of fact, in, in our church, when I was growing up, and you say, what kind of church did you grow up? I'm going to show you on the continuum, and then I'm going to let you kind of decide where you grew up. I can remember in the church that I grew up in, uh, there was a, a, a guy that came into our church. There were several folks that came into our church, and they were kind of on the whoa, crazy, crazy side. All right, And, and that, as they began to talk and talk with people, uh, the reason why I was so connected with this guy is he happened to have a son that was exactly my age. So we hung out together for a season and for a while, and then he eventually moved on from our church. But the whoa, crazy, crazy guy in our church, after he got in, bedded a little bit in our church, he began to teach that every sickness was the result of a demon. 
And so every sickness could be dealt with if you just cast out the demon of, of cancer or the demon of this or the demon of that. And, and here's, the, here's the interesting thought. He was so woe, crazy, crazy that it wasn't just a physical body. Man, he said, if your dishwasher's broken down, call me. I'll come over and cast out the demon of the dishwasher. If your car broke down, it's a demon. If your ceiling fan stopped working, it was a demon. I mean, everything was about some miraculous thing taking place, and it was this monster battle between good and evil. Man, none of it had to do with physics and friction. It all had to do with, whoa, crazy, crazy. Boy, I, I knew I wasn't over there, and pretty quickly he moved on and, uh, from, from our church and kind of was escorted out of the church and said, hey, go away. But then there's some moderating positions. There's probably a dead center where you, you understand the miraculous. And, but, but I probably grew up a little over here in my church. And let me tell you about the church that I grew up in. We, we absolutely valued every word in the Bible from cover to cover. It was God's Word. It was absolutely true. As a matter of fact, um, we would have gone into convulsions had, you, had we walked up on you cutting out anything in your Bible. I mean, that's just the way it was. It was truth from cover to cover. Amen. But let me tell you, if you want to term us anything, you probably would have termed us the frozen chosen. You've heard that term before. You say, what do you mean? We believe the Bible cover to cover. If it said it happened, it happened. But we didn't leave much room for God to move a lot other than for salvation. Boy, our message as a church, it was in words. It was in proclamation. It was in, it was in what we said. And, and that's what it was. There, there wasn't a lot of doing. It was, it was a lot of studying. And boy, you wanted to study and study and study. And there wasn't, wasn't any open space for God to do something incredible. And we found ourselves judging people that talked about God really moving in their lives. And, and we didn't want to. We were just afraid of, whoa, crazy, crazy, right? Now, a little beyond the other side, uh, if you've got the dead deist and you've got the whoa, crazy, crazy, and you've got the frozen chosen, just a little on the other side, uh, uh, let's term them the happy clappy, all right? Happy clappy. I, I would say these folks might be, if you're going to have the, uh, the frozen chosen, depending on where you are, that could have been the Baptist or, or, or the Presbyterians or the Methodist or some different things. Somewhere on that continuum there, uh, they would be on the other side. This side would, would be more the, uh, uh, the Charismatics or the Pentecostals. Or, and we have people from all different backgrounds in our church. Uh, how many of you kind of grew up, anything other than Baptist here, raise your hand. Anything other than Baptist. Isn't that neat? I mean, if you look at our numbers, well over half the people that are in our congregation uh, are not from a Baptist background. So hopefully you're up here uh, uh, and you s hear me talking up here. I'm not picking on the way you grew up. Not at all. I'm just kind of defining that we need to understand there's a, there's a biblical worldview and a Christian worldview that we come from that sometimes it's easier to embrace certain things than other things. I'll guarantee you, based on, uh, as with my upbringing, basically as a frozen chosen, being scared to death of the woe, crazy, crazy, I'd rather not preach this series. I'd rather not, because I know some people, as soon as I start talking about the miraculous healing of Jesus and the fact that God does still move and God does still heal, someone's going to say, there he's gone off his rocker. There are going to be others who say, well, it's about time. Let's bring it on, Pastor. We need to line up healing ministries with oil for everybody, cloth for everybody. We're not going there either. We're just going to see what God's Word has to say and how we apply the miracles and life of Christ to us today. Okay? That's where we are. We're, so wherever you are on this continuum, we're going to basically face the fact that God sent His Son with both miracles and a message. But here's what you need to understand. The miracles were never more important than the message. You might want to write that down somewhere. If you look through God's Word, you can look back over when, when did miracles and power really show up in the lives of individuals. Well, you go back to the Old Testament. It was usually when something, when God was doing a brand new work, 
okay? You go back to the Old Testament and it started with Moses. Remember Moses at the burning bush? The children of Israel were in Egypt. God showed up to Moses in the burning bush, said, Moses, I want you to go. I want you to deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt, out of bondage, take them into the promised land. He goes, well, what's Pharaoh going to say? Or what are the leaders of the children of Israel going to say? And what? Remember, God gave him some miraculous powers to do some crazy things to demonstrate his power. So at the beginning of Moses' life, however, as you go further and further on in Moses' life, you see less and less of the miraculous. Why? Because God was really saying, Moses is my leader. If you go a little further, you see the same thing with Elijah because Elijah wanted to do some mir miracles. That, boy, there were amazing, miraculous, m amazingly miraculous things that took place in, in the life of Elijah. If you look into the New Testament, you see Jesus and all the miracles that took place. If you look in the miracles of Jesus, most of the miracles of Jesus took place early in his ministry, not later in his ministry. You say, why? Now remember, he didn't start his ministry until he was 30, okay? So wherever you are, it's not too late for God to use you. I want you to know that. But why was that? Many times God, early on in the life of, of an organization or a group, he wanted to leave a press, an impression, so he'd bring miracles along with the message so people would take note and would look. If you look in the early church, the apostles... Early on in the book of Acts, the apostles did a lot of miracles early in the book of Acts. You see fewer and fewer towards the end. Why? Because God had established the church and the church was growing. If you look in the apostle Paul's life, well, you say, why would the apostle Paul have the miraculous? Remember, he was doing something new. He was taking the gospel message to who? The Gentiles. So you look in the Apostle Paul's life and you will see God brought the miraculous to his life. And in bringing the miraculous to his life, God was demonstrating that I have chosen the Apostle Paul to take the gospel to the Gentiles. But if you look in Apostle Paul's life, although he healed some, he wasn't able to heal others. And as you get further and further on in the Apostle Paul's ministry and life, and over in Romans chapter 12, he basically, the miraculous has gone away. He's talking about the practical. Why? Because the miraculous should never overwhelm the message. So today I want to look at four quick illustrations and examples of the healing of Jesus by way of introduction. Next week, we're going to begin to look at other healings and other things that took place in God's Word and say, well, why did He do this and why did He do that? And we're going to see each one of those seasons of healing has a significant message for the church today. Has a significant message for the church today. And I don't know where you put yourself on this continuum. But we need to understand that God's Word has a message for us in every word and in every verse. And so we're not going to shy away from some of those places we normally shy away from over the next couple of weeks. So the first uh, healing as we roll into Matthew chapter 8 is we see that Jesus heals a leper. Jesus heals a leper. Now, I want you to know it's pretty prominent uh, that Jesus healed a leper early on in Matthew chapter 8. You say, why? Because if you look through God's Word, a leper was seen as a spiritual illustration of a person who was lost and apart from God. You say, why is that, Pastor? Well, it was used in the community of faith, and Austin talked about even in the New Testament church, because what happened to a leper when they were deemed to have leprosy? Well, let me just kind of talk you through some of the things that took place in the life of a leper. If a person uh, was accused or they thought they might have leprosy, here's what they had to do. According to Leviticus, Old Testament Jewish law, Leviticus chapter 13, they had to go to the priest. The priest would examine their spots and the things that were taking place and the dots on their eyes or what was taking place on their hands or their skin. And the priest would determine, yes, you have leprosy or no, you don't have leprosy or we're not sure, so we're going to set you apart. Once they were deemed that they weren't sure or they certainly had leprosy, here are some things that happened to the leper. First thing they had to do, they were sent out of the city. They were not permitted to live inside the walls of a city. They had to live outside. Not only were they, did they have to live outside the walls of the city, they couldn't come to worship. They couldn't do anything. Why? They were considered defiled. If you look in the Jewish law, there were 61 things that defiled an individual. Leprosy was the second most severe besides death. Pretty significant. 
Now, when they, they separated them, not only did they separate them physically, they added something onto that, that you were allowed to touch no one. Because you had leprosy, you were not allowed to touch anyone. As a matter of fact, if I had leprosy and you approached me, I had to do some things to let you know that I was a leper. The first thing you had to do, as long as the priest had determined that you had leprosy, the first thing you had to do is you had to go tear your clothes. You had to go dishevel your hair. You had to stay within six feet, six feet away from anybody and everybody, including your family. If you had kids, you couldn't touch them. If you had a wife, you couldn't touch her. If you had a husband, you could talk to them, but only from about six feet away. If the, listen to this, go look at the Jewish law. If the wind was blowing, you had to stay 150 feet away. Now imagine being a leper in those days and you have kids and I think about my kids and, 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 and you walk up into a group of people outside the city and all the children run but one. And it's your daughter. And you long and you long and you long and you long for the touch of your daughter or your bride or your husband or whatever. Imagine. I can't touch. Dad, hug me. I cannot. I cannot touch you. And then not only that, did you have to dishevel your hair and tear your clothes and live away from the community and stay at least six feet on a non-windy day or 150 feet away in a windy day when others would approach you? You had to bow down and you had to cover your mouth and you would have to say unclean, 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 unclean to warn them. And if you didn't do any of those things, you'd be stoned and killed. You say, Pastor, thank the Lord. We don't have leprosy in our country. You know, we do. If you go look at the Journal of American Medical Society, they believe about 100 to 100 people are diagnosed with leprosy in our country each and every year. You say, where are those people? Most of them live in the South. True. How many of you know you live in the South? You say, why are they all in the South? Because there are only two animals in America that are known to carry leprosy. One are humans. You know what number two is? The armadillo. So stop playing with armadillos. <laughs> now the good news is we now know once they're diagnosed, we now have, we now have uh, antibiotics that can treat leprosy. And go, but in those days, man, it was a spiritual thing. And, and what would happen is that leper would stay outside the community until what? Either the body was over to, able to overwhelm the leprosy or leprosy overwhelmed them and they died. And if they died, it was a slow, painful, rotting death. And so Jesus shows up because leprosy was used in the Old Testament and the New Testament to describe the spiritual state of someone that was not in communion with God. They didn't have touch. So when we come to Matthew chapter 8, now let's put it on the screen. Let's talk about Jesus healing the leper and look what he did. Look at Matthew chapter 8, verse 1. It says, Then he came down from the mountain. Great crowds followed him. And behold, a leper came to him and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him. Now, Jesus had a very high touch moment. Let me tell you, no one touched the leper. Even when that leper went to the priest who had diagnosed him with leprosy, that priest didn't touch him. That priest just looked at him. But Jesus came up and touched him. And here's my encouragement as we begin this message series on impressions is that we would be a high-touch ministry, that we wouldn't be the kind of ministry of a church that says, oh, no, they, 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 they've got a drinking problem. Let's just kind of, let's don't touch them. Or, oh, they've got a drug problem. Or, you know what, they, 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 they've been divorced. Or, or, man, you know what, they this or, or they that. Or they brought themselves, brought this on themselves. I want you to know we need to have a high-touch ministry. And so no one touched the le leper, but he says, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone. Now, why would Jesus do that? Why would Jesus say, don't go tell anyone? Pretty simple. Jesus never wanted the miraculous to be more important than the message. The message is what saves 
Because, listen, even if he miraculously heals, guess what? Do you see this leper walking among us today? No, he eventually died. Just not of leprosy. We all wind down. The message is always far superior than the miraculous. So he says, say, say nothing to anyone, but go and show yourself to the priest. So Jesus said, follow the law. You need to get back in communion with God. You need to get back into worship. You need to go back to the synagogue. You need to get back with your family. And listen, as God's healing touch moves in your life, I'm not talking about just, just physically. I'm talking about spiritually. You need to go back, get back in touch with God's house and get back in touch with God's people and get back in touch with your family. He says, but go, show yourself to the priest and offer a gift that Moses commanded for a proof to them. You say, what are the lessons, Pastor, that we see in the leper's life? Here, let's just put them up here real quickly. Lessons from the Sin separates us from God and His church. But through Christ, our sins can be forgiven and we can be restored. Many times we are like that we are like that leper. We are outside of the church because of the sin in our lives. We're outside of God's grace and communion with God's people. We don't have any touch with other believers, and we need to understand that through Christ we can be restored. Next, put it up there. We can confidently approach Jesus with all of our needs and with all of our sin, and when we ask for healing and forgiveness, He never turns us away. I don't care what you've done or what kind of life you've lived or what your background looks like. The moment you come to Christ, the moment you come to God and ask Him to heal you spiritually, He will never turn you away and say, you know, there's too much sin built up there. Sometimes we do that to people. Sometimes we get all legalistic on people. We do it to people, but God never does. What did the writer of the book of Hebrews say? Look at it, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. It says, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. This leper, what did he do? He had to draw near to Christ. He had to bow down. He had to get on his knees. He had to ask for forgiveness. What are we told to do in Hebrews? He says, man, that we may receive mercy and grace. Well, how do you do that? By drawing near. Man, how do we help others around us? Come to God's grace and come to God's mercy. Man, if you know somebody that's struggling in sin, the best thing you can do is use a high-touch ministry, drive them up, uh, jerk them, drag them to church. Man, say, now it's your turn. You've got to draw near to God's grace so that they can find mercy and they can find healing. Healing number two is we just begin to move through Matthew chapter 8 and Matthew chapter 9 was Jesus heals a mother-in-law. Now let me just start, stop right here and tell you when we come to, to Jesus healing mother-in-law, he, hollered, he healed this mother-in-law, but he didn't do it to all of them, right? Amen? <laughs> How many of you have a mother-in-law you need to have healed? No, I'm kidding. Don't, don't <laughs> raise your hand, especially if she's in the room. Jesus heals a mother-in-law. What do we see in Matthew chapter 8? Put it up there. When Jesus entered Peter's house, he saw his mother, uh, his mother-in-law lying sick with a fever. He touched her. Everybody say that word. He touched her. He touched her with his hand, and the fever left her, and she arose and began to serve him. So what happened? Boy, the first one we see, and I'm showing you different things just from Matthew chapter 8 and 9, because I'm going to come up to some applications for us when we look at all these healing ministry, the healing ministry of Jesus. Remember the leper? His job, after he was healed, after he had drawn near, was to go get connected with the church. All right? To go back to the priest, get involved in church, draw near to God. Now, the mother-in-law, what happened? As soon as she was healed, she began to serve him. All right? Listen to this. Here's the application. Put it up on the screen. When God's power touches your life, the only proper response is to serve Him. Man, when you are like that leper that has been brought in, or you're like that mother-in-law that God has moved in your life, when, you, when God has restored your marriage, restored this, or put you back on your feet, or gotten you through a difficult time or a hard time, God has moved in your life, the only response is to serve Him. 
How many times, sadly, over our ministry and over my life have you seen and I seen, boy, someone come and they're broken and they're hurting and they're struggling. Man, their marriage is on the rocks and perhaps because of something they've done or this has happened or that has happened. And man, their life is a wreck. And God begins to do a restoring work and a renewing work and he puts the marriage together or puts the family back together or heals them or strengthens them or whatever he does. And as soon as they get back on their feet, what do they do? Boom, they're gone. They're living life back the way they want to do it and they're forgetting all about God. Man, let me tell you, this mother-in-law understood, man, if God has put my life back together, my only proper response is to serve him. So if you're wanting God to do an amazing work in your life, in your finances, a miraculous work, whatever it is, don't say God heal this or God fix this or God do this and then do what? Go your own way. Here's a third one as we look. Just jumping over to Matthew chapter 9, we're going to see not only that, but Jesus heals a woman who touched him. Write that down. Jesus heals a woman who touched him. Now, the leper asked, and Jesus touched him. The mother-in-law was just in the house. Jesus showed up, and Jesus touched her. As we go to Matthew chapter 9, and we see the woman, and she has been struggling for years. And let me tell you a little bit. If you go over to Mark chapter 5, you can read the same story. Mark gives us a little more information about this lady. She has, she has been struggling with an issue of blood for 12 years. And Scripture says that she had for all of those years been going to doctor after doctor after doctor after doctor to be healed. And she had spent all of her resources and all she had and couldn't be healed. Now, I want you to notice a couple of things. First of all, Jesus doesn't chastise her for going to the doctor. There are times that when we get sick, especially in our society, unlike in their society, the first thing we need to do is go to the doctor, right? How many of you know that? Man, if you get a cough, if you get sick, my, my wife uh, this week uh, uh, has been struggling with strep and the flu. How many of you know how exciting those are? So basically, as the priest in my house, I treated her like a leper. Said, I want you to stay within six feet of me at any time. When I walk through the house, I want you to holler unclean. I want you to do all I need to shovel your hair. I want you to pour on the tongue. I tore some clothes up. I didn't do that, by the way, just in case you're wondering. But what do we do? We, we went to the doctor. We went to the doctor. Why? Because we are blessed and God gave us the abilities. We have antibiotics. We have medicines. We have all of these things. There's no, Let me tell you, if you are sick, go to a doctor. And don't shake my hand. But there are times, just like this lady, that only God can heal. How I many even know that? There are times when we've exhausted all opportunity and all medicine and all this and all that, and the only thing we can do is go to Christ. Let's look at it in Matthew chapter 9, verse 19. Here it is. It says, and Jesus, rode, uh, uh, and Jesus rose and followed him. You say, who's the him there, Pastor? It's the rich ruler. We're going to talk about him next week, so you want to be sure and come back. But Jesus, on the way to follow him with his disciples, says, verse 20, And behold, a woman who had suffered with a discharge of blood for 12 years came up behind him and touched him. So Jesus didn't touch her. She touched him on the fringe of his garment. And for she said to herself, If I only touch the garment, I will be made well. Jesus turned and seeing her, he said what? Take heart, daughter. Your faith has made you well. And instantly, it says, the woman was made well. Now, I point that out because we've seen the leper. We've seen a mother-in-law. Now we've seen a lady who had been through all the doctors and she was healed. It says healed immediately. We're going to see over the next couple of weeks that Jesus didn't always heal immediately. Sometimes it was progressive healing. But if you look from the leper to the mother-in-law to this lady, it was always more important how they responded after the healing than the healing itself. She was made well. And we're going to look at, and sadly so, in this circumstance, and we see it was a crowd that was gathered around Jesus. And, and when Jesus was touched, she didn't ask, she didn't beg, she didn't do anything. She just touched the hem of his garment. And she was made well. Jesus turned around and said, who touched me? And sadly, you know what happened? Some of his disciples who were following him said, Lord, it doesn't matter. There's a big crowd of people here. It's really not that important. But part of the message here we're going to see over the next couple of weeks is don't ever be 
a person in this church or any other church that hinders people from coming to Christ. That hinders people from coming to Christ. I've actually known people that really didn't want other people to come to the church because they're afraid they might lose their standing with this person or that person or this group. And I'm like, really? Don't be like those disciples. So you say, what's the application? What's the lesson? Here it is. Put it up on the screen. And this lady, when you're struggling with something, sometimes Jesus is the only place to go. You've exhausted every other option, and there's only one place to go physically. It's Christ. Unless God moves, I'm done. Here's the fourth example I want to give to you. We're just looking at Matthew chapter 8 and Matthew chapter 9 and looking at some principles to open up this message series entitled Impression. And here it is. Jesus heals two blind men. So Jesus has healed a leper, which is, which is symbolic of our spiritual separation and uh, death that we experience outside of God's mercy and outside of the camp of God's love and outside of the camp of God's church. We understand that a mother-in-law who then responded by serving him, uh, a, a woman who, who, who touched him, just reached up and touched him in the midst of a crowd and some of the disciples didn't even get it and respond. Now we see Jesus heal two blind men. You say, well, what happened? Look at it, Matthew chapter 9. It says, and in G as Jesus passed on from there, two blind men followed him, crying aloud, Have mercy on us, Son of God. And when he entered the house, the blind men came to him, him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? And they said to him, Yes, Lord, we believe. Then he touched, everybody say touched. He touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it be, 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 it be done to you. Look at verse 30. And their eyes were open, and Jesus sternly warned them. Notice the words again. See that no one knows about it. But they couldn't contain themselves. But they went away and spread his fame throughout all the district. If you read the rest of the passage, what happened? Jesus had to leave. Why would Jesus constantly heal someone and then say, don't talk about it? Because Jesus never wanted the miraculous to be more important than the message. So, let me give you some thoughts on Jesus' miracles that'll help you in the days gone by. If you've grown up somewhere on this continuum from dead deist to whoa, crazy, crazy, all right? And a lot of times we are and I become so afraid of whoa, crazy, crazy that I almost want to want to not talk about the miraculous at all. But we can't. We have to talk about it. We just have to understand why it happened and its place in our life. Thought number one on Jesus' miracles is this. Jesus could and did heal every kind of disease or sickness and infirmity. But listen to this. He did not heal everyone. And my big struggle with the woe crazy crazy is that they want to think that God wants to heal everybody and God is going to heal everybody and God's going to use them to heal everybody. And what happens is they ultimately, oftentimes, become charlatans. They try to sell God's healing power. You say, Pastor, is that anything new? No. Go read Philippians chapter 1. Even in Paul's day in Philippians chapter 1, at the very end of, G, uh, of, end of Paul's ministry, if you go read Philippians 1, there were some people that were always dogging him in his ministry. And as he was in prison, which he was when he was writing Philippians, people came to him and said, you know, Paul, there's some people out there that are preaching the gospel. We're simply greedy for gain. Paul says, listen, it doesn't really matter to me. He says, I understand some people preach the gospel with character and integrity. Other people preach it because they're greedy for, greedy for gain. Let me tell you. This happened in the New Testament. There are always people, you read it through the book of Acts, there are always people that are going to try to take and sell God's message of the miraculous. But we need to understand that Jesus could have healed and did heal all kinds of diseases and all kinds of infirmity, but he did not heal everyone. Number two, the details of each miracle vary slightly. Jesus never healed anyone the same way. If you look at every miracle, Jesus healed either through different words or different actions, every miracle slightly differently. You say, why did he do that? Well, I think because if he had, he had healed everybody with a certain, a certain set of words or with a certain set of questions, or with a certain cloth, or with a certain oil, what would we do? We would sell that, and we would think there's more important than the process. We would focus more on the process than the power of God. 
So every one of Jesus' healings were slightly varied, slightly different. So we wouldn't come up and we wouldn't do what? So we wouldn't think this. Go to the next one. The variety of methods used by the Lord eliminates the confidence in any one technique or modus operandi. In other words, if all that Jesus had done and healed, if every one of the healings that Jesus had were exactly the same way and he had said exactly the same words and he did exactly this, I would focus more on the process of someone being healed than I would on the power of God in the process. Here's the next thought. Jesus' miracles were never more important than his message. Jesus' miracles were never more important than his message. So, what are the applications for us in the church? Let me give you a couple. Ready? Applications for us in the church. Let's jump to them. Put, a, put the first one up on the screen. God can and does still heal people. I absolutely believe that. I, I absolutely believe, and there's been seasons over the time in this church where someone has re received some incredibly bleak physical news. But through God's power, God has done a work in their life and preserved them and cured them when others thought not possible. And I absolutely believe that God can and still does heal. Second application for us is we need to understand if Jesus had a high-touch ministry, so should we. Write that down. If Jesus was willing to touch the leper, touch the mother-in-law, touch the woman, and touch the blind men, and over, over the next couple of weeks, we're going to see who else he touched. We need to have a high-touch ministry. There is nobody that is untouchable for us. Does that make sense? That's what we need to understand. If Jesus had a high-touch ministry, so should we. Next application for us as a ministry, our ministry should be filled with words and works. I think much of the way I grew up as the frozen chosen, uh, all church was about words and it was not much about works. Not only that, it should be about proclamation and power, doctrine and deeds. We need to understand there's an and, an and, an and. It's not just words, it's works. It's not just proclamation, it's power. It's not just a doctrine, it's deeds. It's all of it together. Finally, next. Do I have another one? Okay. I don't have another. Is that the last one I put on there? <laughs> so there it is. That's the beginning of impressions. And over the next couple of weeks, we're going to look at the healing ministry of Christ and see the biggest call for us as a church is to understand no one, regardless of how we feel about them, is outside of the spiritual healing power of God's grace. Amen? And we need to be involved in touching lives and letting God work through us. Now, I want to invite our uh, altar team. One of the things we've developed over the years is an altar team. And our altar team is trained to pray with you and encourage you along the way. And it's a high-touch ministry. It's a high-prayer ministry. And so every week I say, listen, don't head to the door if you need to head to the altar. And that's how we're going to close today. Also, don't forget that you are reminded and invited to stick around with our, uh, our church for a dinner on the grounds. If you are a guest, be here. I'd love the opportunity to shake your hand and get to know you today. But stay here. So I'm going to pray. When I say amen, our altar team is going to be down here. If you would like the healing touch of God in your marriage or in your life or whatever it is in a sin that you're struggling with, Come down to the altar, and we'll pray with you. And don't, don't, don't head to the door if you need to come to the altar. Let's pray, and we'll go. Father, we love you, and we thank you so much for this day. God, what a joy it is to be your child, to know your love and know your grace. Father, let us be a church that is a high-touch church. God, never let our proclamation be simply that, but let it come with power and works and deeds. And God, move through our church to be willing to touch the untouchable and love the unlovable and minister to those who normally we wouldn't minister to. Why? Because that's your grace. That was the message of your son Jesus as he touched the leper, as he touched the mother-in-law, as he touched the woman, as he touched the blind man. God, let us be open to whomever you want. And God, let us be open to let your power move through us to touch the lives of many for your grace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen.